Hey everyone, thanks for joining us and welcome to our Tour de Mont Blanc breakdown video. In this video, we're going to be going over three main parts. Part one is preparation and gear. Part two is frequently asked questions. And part three are tips and suggestions we learned while hiking the TMB. Starting with schedule and itinerary, we completed the TMB in 11 days. We probably could have done it in 10 days because we did have one really short day towards the end, but we did enjoy taking our time. We actually piggybacked this trip off of our friends, Nilda and Sean. And when they first told us about 10 months out, we thought they were absolutely crazy. We didn't come around to the idea until about six months out. And by then, most of the places we wanted to stay were already booked. So we suggest you plan well in advance. We based our 11 days counterclockwise from Lazouche itinerary off our friend schedule and also off the Knife Edge guidebook, but we'll get into that guidebook a little more later. So I typed up my own daily hiking breakdown to use as a quick reference while on the trail. For example, one day we would include the starting location and the ending location with the total miles. It would have elevation gain, descent, maximum altitude that we would be at for that day, and also the estimated time hiking. And then I broke it down even further with those same stats for each section of the trail so that we would know how far and what exactly each segment of the trail looked like before getting to the next refuge or town. We'll leave a link to that hiking breakdown in the description. One thing to keep in mind though is that the total estimated time hiking is just hiking alone. It does not include the rest stops and lunch breaks. So when a day says estimated time hiking is about six hours, it doesn't mean if you start hiking at 8 a.m. you're gonna finish by 2 p.m., which we realized pretty quickly. I think most days we were averaging about one and a half to two hours total of breaks and lunchtime. Training for the hike. So this one's a bit of a doozy for me. My initial plan included increased cardio and strength training, but after only about two months of steady training, I had an old hamstring injury flare up. And then I spent the last four months before the trip in physical therapy, nursing my hamstring back to health. It's definitely not where I pictured myself right before the trip. So for me, I mainly focus my workouts around increasing my cardio quite a bit with the Peloton we have. And I even used an elevation mask to make those workouts a little more challenging and strengthen my lungs. So I accomplished that by creating my own workout regimen that I followed pretty strictly for a little over six months. I started out slow with one hour a week on the Peloton for the first month, and then one hour a week wearing the mask the following month. And I would just increase my workout time on the bike by 30 minutes every two months. And by the end of that, I was up to about two hours a week with the mask. So obviously there's no black and white answer to how to train for the TMB. It's gonna depend heavily on what your level of fitness is, your strengths are, your weaknesses. But I will say that it's extremely obvious to me that my cardio training paid off for me on the TMB, especially on those steep elevation gains. The only other measure we took before the trip was about a week out, we increased our water intake significantly. And one thing that we both increased with our training was stretching a lot more in those months leading up to the trek. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is gear on the TMB. We'll start off with the type of packs we use. We both had Osprey packs. Mine was a 48 liter Kestrel and Courtney's was a 48 liter Kite. And we felt like those packs were pretty good for a trip like this. We never felt like those packs were too big or too small for the TMP. Now we'll get into items that were in our packs after we ditched some things to cut weight. We'll get into exactly what we got rid of later. So we'll start by going over the items that we both had in our packs. We both had a Camelback. Mine's three liters and hers is two liters, which was plenty. We do recommend using a Camelback if you can. It helps you keep your momentum going without having to stop and get out a bottle every time you want to drink. And it also reminds you to hydrate more than you probably would if you didn't have a tube in your face all day reminding you to drink water. So definitely use a Camelback if you can. We both carried down jackets, trekking poles we found on Amazon, nothing fancy. We also both had sleep masks and earplugs. And the cool thing about the sleep mask is they have eye pockets so the masks aren't pressed against your face, which made it much more comfortable to sleep in. We both carried sleep liners, also known in Europe as meat sacks, which is a term I'm not a fan of. We got the ones that cover your pillow, which is a must. That way you don't have to sleep on used pillows. Our friend's sleep liners didn't end up covering their pillows, so they had to use towels and other things to cover their pillows at night, which is just kind of annoying. One of our favorite pieces of gear that we carried were our microfiber towels from Wise Owl. The towels were so soft and even came with a washcloth. I did feel a little bit spoiled with the size of our towels compared to some of the smaller towels I saw other hikers using. Another must are shower flip-flops. We bought some that had holes in them for quicker drying and we never had to worry about wet feet. We both had very minimalistic toiletry kits and we even shared a bar of soap and a tube of toothpaste just to keep our pack weight down and not take up too much space. We both had a heavy duty pair of gloves for the ladders portion of the trail. We probably would have been fine without them, but I wanted us to be as safe as possible during this potentially dangerous portion of the TMB. I will say, I don't think I could have survived the trip without Tiger Bomb. We each carried our own jars and used every last bit of them over the course of the 11 days. For footwear, Joseph wore Adidas Terex hiking shoes, and I wore a lightweight boot by Columbia. It was important for me to have the added ankle support. 
We also both carried a lightweight pair of Suave's collapsible travel shoes to change into every night. So next we'll go over items we used that only one of us had in our packs. I carried a small bottle of New Skin, which is a liquid bandage, and I also carried foot powder for us. I carried a small sunscreen and a bug spray, but I think I only used the bug spray once or twice the whole trip. I carried a small power bank as a backup power source for when we couldn't get to an outlet. I never travel anywhere without our pill box and made sure to stock up on extra ibuprofen for this trip, which we still ended up buying more. And I carried a bunch of liquid IV packets for us to drink every day to keep our electrolytes up, but we did wind up purchasing more at a pharmacy on the trail. I also had a headlamp just in case we ever found ourselves outside or still hiking while it was dark, but we never wound up using it except for one time for fun when we came across a cool little cave. I carried a Grail Geo Press on the side pocket of my pack and the Knife Edge guidebook and a hard copy map of the TMB. I read a lot about snacks before the trek and if you should bring them or not. A lot of people said food was plentiful on the trip, but when I hike, my metabolism goes into overdrive, so I didn't feel good about not packing anything. I ended up bringing a lot. Honey waffles, almonds, dried mango, protein bars, beef sticks, and some candy, and I literally ate all of the snacks that I brought with me. I also carried our stem therapy, which is really lightweight. We debated on bringing a roller, but decided not to to save some weight in our packs. The stem therapy worked out great and was a perfect way to recover after a long day of hiking. I also carried our power converter. It was a bit heavier than I'd like, but came in handy with so many charging ports. And lastly, I carried the GoPro and one spare GoPro battery and a few different charging cords for some of our electronics. Now we'll get into the clothes we both brought for the TMB. I brought two pairs of pants, including the pair I was wearing, so I only had one extra pair in my pack. I also had two long sleeve button down shirts, including the one I was wearing. I had one lightweight hoodie long sleeve shirt and one pair of athletic shorts to change into every night. And lastly, I had three pairs of socks and four pairs of underwear, which doesn't sound like a lot, but like I said, we'll talk a little bit more about what we wound up ditching and why. So I brought a romper to sleep in as well as loungewear after hiking, one pair of shorts to hike in, two shirts, a rain jacket, a beanie, a long sleeve hooded shirt, one pair of pants, and three pairs of socks and underwear. And then I also had with me one pair of compression socks, which were mostly for the plane, and then an ankle brace, which I did end up using for added ankle support. So part two for this breakdown video is gonna be frequently asked questions that we've seen mostly on the TMB Facebook groups. The first question we saw a lot was just how hard is it? Obviously this question is super subjective and it's going to depend heavily on each individual's personal fitness levels, your strengths, your weaknesses, your limitations, etc. But for us, we will say that the first few days were pretty difficult for us. It definitely took us a while to get over the extreme soreness and into a noticeable rhythm. And at that point, the TMB became a lot more enjoyable for us. But we weren't a lot less sore until about five days into the trail. I will say we had some added unnecessary panic right before the trip because someone posted on the Facebook group that no one was talking about how hard it was. <laughs> so I think that gave me some uh, extra anxiety right before we started. How long does it take? Depends on how much of the trail you're trying to do. We met people on the trail who are only doing a certain portion. It also depends on how much you're willing to hike each day. We were comfortable hiking about eight to 12 miles a day, but some people hiked 15 to 20. So you have to build an itinerary that fits your comfort level. Should I bring hiking boots or hiking shoes? Again, this is gonna be based on personal preference. I normally like to hike in heavy duty boots, protect my feet and give me some ankle support. But because the TMB is over a week long, I decided to go with hiking shoes that are much more lightweight. I know Courtney usually likes to hike in heavy duty boots as well, but opted for a lighter weight boot for the TMB because she wanted to cut weight and wasn't willing to get rid of that ankle support. Whatever you choose, break them in before starting the trail. I literally walked around our neighborhood wearing my hiking boots. Some people have said you can do the trek in running shoes, but Joseph recommends footwear that have rock plates on the bottom because there are a lot of rocky trails on the TMB. Do I need walking sticks? Once again, this is gonna come down to personal preference. Some people love walking sticks, other people hate them. We find them to be extremely useful in both steep ascents and descents. On the TMB, there were a ton of steep spots where I know I relied heavily on my walking sticks to keep as much pressure off my knees as I possibly could. And even with the walking sticks, my knees were still screaming in a few parts. Also, I have caught myself before with the sticks and prevented a fall. So maybe if you're a little more prone to slipping, the walking sticks might be a good option for you. Can I bring walking sticks in my carry-on baggage? Be sure to check the rules for your airline, but in the US, typically no, they aren't permitted. We have heard instances where carbon fiber sticks have gotten through security though. How much should my pack weigh? So for hiking in general, hikers are advised not to go over 20% of their body weight. However, on a trek like the TMB that's quite longer than just a day hike, we recommend trying to come in somewhere around 10 to 15% of your body weight, not including your drinking water weight. 
Obviously the lighter the better, we can't stress this enough. If you don't absolutely need it, you should probably get rid of it and I promise you, you do not need 15 pairs of socks. <laughs> How is the food on the TMB? So food varies a lot depending on where you are. In a major city like Cormayor or Chamonix, there were options to eat at nice restaurants and local stores to pick up snacks and groceries. As for the meals in the refuges, all refuges are not created equal. We found that the closer the refuge was to a major town or the more accessible it was, the nicer the meals were. For example, Refuge Elena was close to Cormayor and we had huge bowls of pasta, turkey, veggies and cornbread, and then pastries for dessert. At this refuge, we also ate lunch the day we arrived and ate a huge ham. Whereas super remote places like Elizabetta just served bread for breakfast, opposed to other places that served eggs, bread, jams, yogurt, cereal, fruit, cheese, and meats. There are times on the TMB where you go through little towns with cafes or grocery stores, but I found that there were fewer than I expected the first couple days on the trek. We also heard mixed reviews about picnic lunches, but found them to be super convenient and worth purchasing. Most of them came with a sandwich, fruit, snack, and dessert. What is lodging like on the TMB? This is going to depend heavily on how you set up your itinerary and where you're going to wind up each night. If you're in the middle of nowhere and there are only refuges available, or if you're in a major city and there are plenty of hotels and Airbnbs. Or if you're doing the TMB on a budget or just super adventurous, camping is also an option, but it's going to take a little bit more research on where you're legally allowed to camp. For us, there was one night where all the refuges were full in one town, so we wound up taking a bus to the next city over and staying in an Airbnb. Then in the morning, we took the bus back to the town with the refuges to meet our friends and start the day's hike. Most refuges seem to have dorms, smaller dorms, and private rooms, and we were able to upgrade two of our dorm reservations to private rooms, one of which came with a private bath, which that alone was worth upgrading. Me. All refuges are not created equal, and some dormitories have sleeping mats that are right next to each other versus others with separate bunks divided by partitions. When you're doing your research, look for pictures of the dorms and ensure you're comfortable with the type of sleeping arrangements they have set up. What are the bathrooms like on the TMV? There aren't public facilities often on the trail between refuges or towns. I recall only one or two that weren't inside of a local shop or cafe. There were also one or two that I didn't even try to get to because of the amount of extra walking involved to get there. I did go in nature several times, so it just depends on your bladder capacity and if you want to hold it. I prefer not to because of where my waist strap sits. It wasn't hard to find a place to go in nature, just be sure that you pack it out when you do. The best opportunities to use bathroom facilities are at refuges along the way or in towns when you stop to eat, so just be sure to take full advantage when you do stop. Lastly, I wanted to talk about the bathrooms inside the refuges. Like we've said before, not all refuges are created equal. In some, cleanliness is not up to par, some have more privacy. Even with refuges that only had one or two stalls, I didn't have to wait long to use the bathroom. What are showers at refuges like on the trail? Some showers were token operated where you get an allotted amount of hot water and other refuges had unlimited free hot water. Some places had no hot water at all. And with the token operated showers, you can usually opt to take a cold shower, but it's literally glacial water, so it's freezing. Only one refuge made us pay separately to use the showers. All others offered a coin with your reservation. And Bonnebri, Maya Joey, and Auberge Le Bourne offered unlimited free hot water. If you're staying at Auberge Le Bourne, there are only three showers in total, but you do have unlimited hot water, which is a plus. We strongly encourage you to shower as soon as you get in versus waiting until after supper or before bed when the facilities are super crowded. How often is potable water available? Water fountains are plentiful along the trail, so much to the point where a lot of times we just use them to freshen up. Contamina Vanum is a challenging trail where you'll probably drink more water, and I didn't notice any opportunity to fill up along the way, and I was just about to run up as we got up there. I'd carry extra water during that stretch. In our experience, the vast majority of refuges had potable water. On our trip, only one refuge did not have potable water, and that was La Fledgerie, but they did have it available, you just had to ask for it. In the morning, they did have tanks so you could fill up your camelbacks and bottles. Can you do laundry on the TMB? We discovered it was a lot easier to wash our clothes or have our laundry done than we thought it was going to be. I think just about every refuge had an area where you can hand wash your clothes, but we also found at least one of our refuges had a washer and dryer and we were able to pay to have a load done. And that cost 10 euros to wash and 10 to dry. The one Airbnb we stayed at let us use their washer and dryer for a load, and the hotel we stayed at in Cormayeur also had a service and we paid about 10 euro there to have a load done. Is Wi-Fi available at their refuges? In our experience, Wi-Fi was available at 60% of the refuges we stayed at, and cell service was good in almost every place. Even if you didn't have service inside, you could step outside and still have signal. Will I have access to outlets to recharge my electronics? 
Most refuges had accessible outlets and some even had legitimate charging stations. Other refuges, the outlets were a little bit more scarce, but you could probably find one if you really looked for it or you wanted to wait for one that was already being used. If we were ever at a location that didn't have convenient outlets bedside, we would just use our power bank to charge up for the night. How much money do I need and what currencies? This is going to be dependent on whether the refuges you stay at take card or not. Some are cash only. In our experience, most of them took card, but you'll have to research your refuges. In some areas, Switzerland still uses franc, but in our experience, all those places accepted euros as well. Before we get into part three of the video, we're going to be going over items we wound up ditching after day one on the TMB, which was a lot. After a brutal first day on the trail, we quickly decided we were going to have to dump some serious weight if we were going to survive the TMB, so we wound up paying our hotel in Le Contamine to transfer a bag of all the stuff we wanted to get rid of and take it back to our first hotel, Chalet du Bois, where we would also be staying when we finished the TMB. It cost 40 euros for the luggage transfer, but I was more than willing to pay to lighten our load. So that night, we took a hard look at everything we brought and cut it down as much as we possibly could. We got rid of our packing cubes, laundry bags, and any extra clothes we had. Joseph stuck with only one pair of shorts and shirt each for the rest of the trip, and I kept my romper for changing into. I got rid of a first aid and survival kit that I always take with me on hikes. We ditched my headlamp and decided that we could live with one if we ever got caught in the dark, and I also left a large book behind that I had. I got rid of a beanie and a pair of cold weather gloves, and we both lost our face mask gaiters. I also took out a third pair of pants that were pretty heavy and decided two were more than enough. I left a few pairs of socks and underwears, and lastly, we got rid of most of our electronics, including the drone, a GoPro stabilizer, a couple of cases, headphones, and a ton of extra batteries that I didn't need. The only thing I got rid of that I regretted was my rain jacket. I figured my puffy jacket was enough, even though it's not exactly waterproof, it would still be enough to keep me at least somewhat dry. It wound up raining for several days, and a few of those days were light and sporadic enough to not get me completely soaked, but the day we skipped due to the bad weather, I got drenched just waiting for the bus. We wound up finding a cheap rain poncho in the next town, but it never rained like that again. Of course. We never got a chance to weigh the whole bag, but I'm guessing it was probably around 10 to 15 pounds of extra weight that we didn't need. Something that we packed that we didn't really use on the TMB was our insect repellent. Things that we brought that were absolute must-haves were our earplugs, sleep masks, sleep liners, and our wise owl towels, which leads us into the sponsor of this video. Just kidding, but that'd be totally awesome. Part three, our tips and suggestions based on what we learned after completing the TMB. Follow the TMB Facebook page. There's tons of helpful advice, suggestions, and more. And if you want some last minute panic like I did before the trip, be sure to check out the post before you hike. I mentioned this earlier, but if you're going to stay in a dormitory, still ask if an upgrade is available for a private room. That's how we were able to upgrade twice. Which leads us to our next tip, which is to start early every day and get to the refuges as early as you can. This will allow you to take a shower first thing before the crowds start checking in. And as we mentioned before, it will give you the opportunity to inquire about upgrades before they're all gone. We dodged a few dormitories that way, and the extra comfort and privacy is so worth it. Purchase the Knife Edge TMB guidebook. It's loaded with extremely detailed information that will make your life a whole lot easier. Make sure you have a debit card in case the readers don't accept credit cards. In our experience, the machines only accepted debit, and it won't tell you why, it'll just tell you your card is declined. It happened to us several times, and we learned pretty quickly that we just needed to use a debit card instead. If you're taking a shower with allotted hot water, don't use the maximum water pressure and the highest heat or your shower will be over before you know it. If you only use a little bit of pressure and a temperature warm enough to shower with, you'll be surprised at how long your shower can last for. I used this trick at Refuge Elena and my shower was actually so long that I got tired of showering and I just cranked my pressure and heat up all the way and then the shower ended in about 10 seconds. And I did the complete opposite of that at Refuge Elena and I started my shower with the highest heat and pressure and I think my shower ended in like two or three minutes, so definitely take Joseph's advice. Depending on your phone service provider, if you're interested in having service while trekking, we recommend that you get a SIM card. It's more cost effective than paying $10 a day, especially if you plan to use your phone every day. Some apps that are handy if you do have service are SBB Mobile, Google Translate, All Trails, and Roam to Rio. If you don't plan to have phone service, be sure to download offline maps. Bring new skin and Luco tape to use on the trail. We use strips of the Luco tape on our heels and it can last for days even with taking showers. We use new skin liquid bandages on our blister hotspots and around our toes to prevent blistering. We first used new skin on the Inca trail and I don't think we'll ever hike without it again. 
Yeah, on this hike, I think I actually developed a blister within the first or second day, but just by putting new skin on it every morning, I was able to do the entire trek and it didn't become a problem. We also powder our feet with foot powder every morning before putting on our socks to hopefully soak up as much moisture as we could to also prevent blistering. And I don't think our wool socks were ever wet, even after a full day of hiking which is the second part of this tip to buy wool socks if you don't have them already. They're a little bit more expensive, but well worth it. Lastly, always bring at least a few feet of duct tape. You never know when you'll need to fix or patch up something. One time the sole of Courtney's boot came off in the middle of a hike and we just used duct tape to fix it until we could get her some new ones. I rolled the duct tape around the foot powder bottle and the Luco tape around the new skin bottle to save room and weight instead of bringing both rolls. Carry a refillable water bottle and keep it easily accessible. There were many times we got to a drinking fountain and it was just much easier to take out the bottle and drink however many bottles we felt like while we were there, as opposed to taking off our packs and having to access our camel bags in order to refill. Using a refillable water bottle at fountains also helped us conserve the water in our pack to get a filtered one if you can. We can't stress this last tip enough. Cut weight on your pack load. You don't need as much clothes as you think you do. Take as little as you can and keep in mind it's not hard to find ways to do laundry. Most of the gear we used on the TMB is available on Amazon. We'll leave an affiliate link to the items we vouch for, such as the Grell filtered water bottle, the sleep mask, sleep liners, walking sticks, and wise owl towels that we wound up loving so much. You can check it all out in the description below. If you have any questions about the Tour de Mont Blanc, feel free to leave them in the comment section below and we'll get to them as soon as we can. And if you haven't seen our full length video on the TMB, be sure to check it out. We also have hiking videos on the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu and Acatonango in Guatemala if you're thinking about doing either of those. We hope you enjoyed this breakdown of the TMB and as always, thanks for watching.